Chapter 4. An Indian Secret. Mr. Barnes, come here, Pete cried out. Please. The mailman hurried up the walk to see what the trouble was. When the children told him, he rang the doorbell. Getting no response, he rapped loudly. Still no one came to answer it. I work for the United States government, Mr. Barnes called out. You must answer. Soon they heard someone coming rapidly down the stairs. A woman opened the door and stepped onto the porch. What's wrong, she asked. Mr. Barnes explained, and she apologized for her son's rudeness. A strange package did come here, she went on. Please step inside. Mr. Barnes and the Hollisters followed her into the hall and looked at the address on the box. It was crudely printed and read, Edward Indian Road, West Shore. Edward is Indy Road's first name, Mr. Barnes said. And Edwards is our name, the woman explained. So that's how the mix-up occurred, I suppose. I was going to give the box back to our mailman tomorrow to return to the chaparral. My son wanted to keep it, but of course I would not let him. Thank you for helping us, Pam smiled. Mr. Barnes carried the carton of trinkets to the car, and Pete and Pam suggested that they drive directly to Indy's house with it. Fine, the mailman said. When they arrived, Mr. Barnes stayed in the car while Pete and Pam went in with the package. Indy was preparing a delicious smelling supper. Seeing the package, he smiled broadly. I can hardly believe my good fortune, he exclaimed happily. How'd you locate this? After Pam told him, Indy thanked the children. What is it you're cooking, Pam asked, sniffing the wonderful aroma. It's a Mexican dish called pozole, Indy said as he went into the kitchen to stir the food. Um, what's it made of? The girl continued. Hominy, pieces of pork, and chili, the man said, smiling. It's very popular in the Southwest. He spooned a little into a small dish and offered it to the children. Try it. Pete and Pam tasted the unusual food and both said they liked it. When you go to Pueblo land, Indy said, walking outside with his collars, you will find plenty of Mexican and Spanish dishes. Many of the people there are descendants of the Spanish who came to that part of the country 400 years ago. That's interesting, Pam said. Someday will you tell us more? Tomorrow, Indy promised. I'll tell you about my niece and nephew, too. Pete and Pam said goodbye, expecting to see their friend the next afternoon. However, early the next morning, he stopped at their house and said he wanted them to help him arrange his booth at the county fair. I'll ask mother, Pam said. She gave her permission, saying she would bring the others later, and the children hurried to Indy's car. By the time they arrived at the fair an hour later, the place was bustling with activity. Men were putting up tents, carpenters were finishing booths, and women were covering them with bunting and colorful crepe paper. Indy parked, then swung the large box from the chaparral onto his left shoulder and walked toward a small booth. Reaching it, he set the package down and pried open the top. As he lifted out some of the articles, Pam exclaimed in delight, and Pete said, Oh boy, these are swell! There were fancy blankets, lovely Indian dolls, beaded moccasins, pretty red and blue drums, pottery, beadwork, silver, and turquoise jewelry. I've never seen lovelier things in my life, Pam remarked. It looks like, like Christmas. Let's arrange small pieces first, Indy suggested. Then I'll take out the larger ones. Pete and Pam worked with him to arrange the articles to best advantage on the three tiers of shelves. Then the Indian unpacked more objects. Bows and arrows, Pete exclaimed, picking up an Indian archery set. May I try this, Indy? He asked, twanging the bowstring. The Yumaton said that he would be glad to let Pete use it a little later. But right now, he continued, will you children decorate the booth for me while I go to the official tent to register? The hammer and tacks and fancy paper are in the car, Pete. We'll do it, Pam answered. Her brother got them, and they started tacking up the bright-colored decorations. As they were finishing, 
Pete and Pam heard the clatter of horses' hoofs. Turning, they saw a line of cowboys coming along single file on pinto horses. I didn't know they were going to have a rodeo, Pete exclaimed. This is keen. After the riders had passed by, another group of men trudged behind them, leading several fierce-looking longhorn bulls and a few Brahmin cattle. Crickets, Pete yelled. Do you suppose they're going to ride them? I'll ask one of the men. He ran over and spoke to the last cowboy in line. He was a little older than the others and was dressed in a bright velvet shirt, blue jeans, and brown deerskin moccasins. His long black hair hung in two braids on either side of his weather-beaten face. Around his neck, he wore turquoise and silver beads. When Pete asked the Indian whether any of the men would try to ride the bulls, he replied, yes, cowboys stay on bulls, very good. At that moment, he spied Indy's booth. He went over to it with a strange expression on his face. Yumatan, he said, picking up a piece of pottery with a cloud and arrow design. Yes, they are, Pam replied. How could you tell? Yumatan cross arrows like this, he said, pointing. Do you know the Yumatans? Pete asked him. The Indian replied that he was a member of a tribe which lived close by the Yumatans. Then he said, I am Warhorse. Like Yumatan, good Indians. Work hard, make nice things. Suddenly his eyes lighted on a silver snake ring. Warhorse reached forward to touch it and smiled. You buy silver snake ring? He asked. Owner will have good luck. He hurried off to catch up with the rodeo cowboys. Good luck? Pam asked raising her eyebrows and staring at the ring. Maybe we should buy it. When Indy returned a little later, they told him what had happened. I thought a snake was bad luck, Pete said. Oh no, Indy replied, a smile spreading over his broad face. Snakes are little brothers to the Indians. They carry messages to the spirits deep in the earth. That's why some Indians dance with live snakes when they pray for rain. I'd like a good luck ring, Pam remarked. If I wear it, perhaps we'll find the lost mine. Take it as a present for helping me, Indy said, handing the shiny ring to Pam. Oh, thank you, she exclaimed. You're very welcome. You're good children, just like my niece and nephew. Before Pam had a chance to ask about them, Indy continued, By the way, your mother's arrived with your brother and sisters. They'll meet you at the Ferris wheel. Let's go, Pam, Pete cried. They raced toward the giant Ferris wheel, which loomed high into the sky on the far side of the fairgrounds. They found the other Hollisters and Pete bought tickets. Let's ride in cars on opposite sides of the wheel, he proposed. Then we can wave to one another. All right, his mother agreed and told the man to arrange it this way. Okay, he grinned. You're the only passengers, so you can make the rules. Mrs. Hollister stepped into one of the double cars with Sue, Ricky, and Holly. Then the wheel went around. When they were at the top, it stopped, and Pete and Pam got into the car at the bottom. After they were seated, the Ferris wheel started again. Round and round it went. Each time Pete and Pam were opposite the others, they would all shout and wave. Toot, toot, Ricky imitated a train. See you next week. A few moments later, when Pete and Pam were on the ground level, the Ferris wheel gave a sudden jolt and stopped. The two children got out and waited for the amusement ride to start up again. But it did not start, and the owner came out excitedly, saying to them, First time I ever had trouble like this. The cog wheels are jammed, and the machine won't move until I get a new part for it. You mean my, bro my mother and my brother and sisters can't get down? Pam exclaimed in alarm. That's right, maybe not until tomorrow. The Hollister children stared up at the other members of their family. They might have to stay in the car all night. But we just have to get them down, Pam cried. Pete thought quickly. Maybe the firemen can rescue them. Now that's an idea, said the man. Suppose you go call them, son. 
As Pete ran off to find a telephone, the Ferris wheel owner cupped his hands and called to Mrs. Hollister, Don't get nervous. We're bringing the fire department to get you. Yikes, said Ricky. He was the first one to spy a red hook and ladder as it turned off the highway and drove across the fairgrounds. While its siren wailed and a big red light blinked off and on, people hurried from all directions. We're going to be saved, Holly cried. We'll go down a ladder just like from a burning building, Ricky shouted. Sue was rather frightened and clung tightly to Mrs. Hollister. As the hook and ladder came to the base of the Ferris wheel, the crowd cheered. The firemen slowly raised a ladder. Up, up, up it came until it reached the side of the car. A fireman, moving with the speed of a monkey, raced up the ladder. But as he neared the top, it began to dip away from the car. This will never work, the fireman called out. The car isn't steady enough to support the ladder. We'll have to try another way to rescue you. How? Mrs. Hollister asked, concerned. Do you think all of you could jump down in our big net? The fireman asked. Oh, Holly cried. Ricky's heart pounded like mad. The fireman hurried down the ladder and it was drawn back into the truck. Then he and the other men took out a large life net and opened it. Standing in a circle, they held onto it tightly beneath the car in which the Hollisters waited. Jump, one of the men called. I want to go first, Ricky cried, pulling himself to the railing of the car.